Today we're back in New York for another episode of Talking Watches. We'll be speaking with the founder and editor of both Revolution and the Rake magazine, a fashion icon and a watch collector. His name is Wei Ko, and today we're Talking Watches. Wei Ko, international man of mystery, <laughs> here in New York City in the Hodinkee office. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, it's, yeah. it's our pleasure. So what was the first watch you bought when Revolution became a success? Like the first watch where you remember shit, like I've really made it. I think uh, when it was with Panerai, you know, Panerai. Um, uh, Pam 61, titanium, mm -hmm. luminor or merino, tobacco dial, which I still have. But that was a very significant watch because I was like, wow, I can actually afford for the first time some of the watches that I've been writing about. And so I see you're a collector of independence, it seems. So why don't we start with, with this guy over here? So Uwork is a really interesting brand for me as well. I, I remember going in 2005 to the Basel Fair. And what was so unique about it was the, for the first time I'd seen people create watches that define an entire new language for telling time. And so Ulvork was really interesting to me for that perspective that they were transforming time from a civil sort of logistical reading into something that was expressive. I once got to meet my hero, Ralph Lauren. And I remember, you know, he'd shown me such an extraordinary day and, and such an incredible hot kindness in terms of the time I got to spend with him. And he was sitting in this black, matte black Lamborghini Aventador. And I was just thinking, you know what, I have the perfect watch for you to wear when you're driving this. So the next time I came to New York, I gave him a UR-103 hexagon, unique piece in steel. And it was very funny because when I, fir I first spoke to him afterwards about the watch, I was like, Mr. Lauren, you like this watch? And he was very sweet. He said, uh, I like the fact that you gave it to me, which <laughs> essentially meant like, I, you know, <laughs> I don't like it at all, but you're very sweet. It's funny, the first time I met him, he was telling me about his watch collection. He yes. says he has an Erwerk. And I was like, why does Ralph Lauren get, get an Erwerk? He's like, wait, Co gave it to me. I was like, ah, there it is. Oh, that's very sweet. And then Debethune, right next door. So Debethune is an extraordinary brand. Debethune, you know, Denny Flagerle, I think, is sort of the greatest living watchmaker today. So this is the DB28T uh, Tourbillon, right? And it's, it's really, this is kind of like an embodiment of, of everything that he does super well. He, he's got the world's lightest sort of tourbillon cage in here with an oscillator with silicone arms and a piece of platinum around it. 30 second tourbillon, so you know, rotates twice in a minute, you know, and, and it's just at the same time, I love the fact that, that he was the first guy to use grade five titanium, like super, you know, refined, polished. And then he found this thermal treatment that turned it blue as well, so it's... It's so blue. <laughs> it's remarkably <laughs> it's, blue. It's, it's good. And the articulating lugs. And the articulating lugs are amazing as well, so... It's a breathtaking watch, you know, it I put it on is. and it just makes me happy. Another brand that I would say also you, you kind of represent very proudly is Richard Mille. So th this is the RM21. It's a titanium case. It's got an orthohombic. I had to look that up. I didn't know what the hell that meant, which just turned out means eight-sided. Uh, <laughs> uh, eight-sided uh, titanium honeycomb base plate, which is kind of like what it's, you'll find inside of the fuselage of aviation parts. Now I've got it on the Velcro strap, which Super I love cool. even more because yeah. it's kind of like you can, you know, wear it swimming or doing, you know, jogging or in soul cycle. You do wear it swimming. I do. I wear it, you know, jogging or in soul cycle this morning. I'm sorry, but it's a bit damp. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... But you know what's cool about Richard Mill also is that it really is like being part of a club. Like I remember I was in this tiny six-seater sushi restaurant in, in Ginza in Tokyo. And I go to the toilet and I, this hand just comes out and goes like this. And I turn around and this guy's looking at me and he's got this big grin on his face. I'm like, what's going on here? And he goes, I like your watch. <laughs> and then he goes like this and he's wearing an Arm 03. Yeah. And then his friend next to him goes, I like your watch too. And he like busts out like an Arm 11, right? So I go to the toilet, I come back and there's like a 1.5 liter bottle of sake sitting in front of me. And I say to the chef, I'm like, oh, listen, I, I didn't order this. And they're like, oh, no, I sent it to you. So I start pouring for them. They start pouring for me. We all start pouring for the chef. Three hours later, we're having the most amazing time, you know? Then uh, they leave and you know, I go to settle my bill and, and the chef is like, are you kidding me? No, no, they took care of it. He said something like, you guys are all the same family, which, oh, is, which is what's great about Richard Mill. So on the other side of the spectrum, yes. we go traditional and we have a Vacheron. We do, we do, we do. So, so um, I love the Corn de Bosch, and I have to say that I think that the steel Corn de Bosch that you guys did is one of the most beautiful watches of all time. Thank you. It's so absolutely much. stunning. It's very um, but I had, had spoken to um, Christian Selmany and Charlie Torres at the time, and I said, listen, I'd love to enter into this unique Atelier Cabernetier um, sort of uh, program. Would it be possible for me to make a unique execution of this watch? And, he, and they said, sure, I mean, just tell us a little bit about your ideas. And I said, I'd like to make one that is in some ways even sort of more backwards looking. So I wanted to do it in yellow gold, because again, that's kind of like a sort of a, a more classic material. I wanted a sort of smoked silver dial, and I wanted to have a pulse meter as well. And so it was great to be able to sit through that process and, and create the different dial execution. So in the end, we had like four different dials 
And the amazing thing was when they gave me that watch, they gave me the box also with three more dials so I can change them as I want throughout the sort of, you know, lifetime that I have with this watch. And then another yellow gold watch, the AP, the big boy. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so this is a funny watch as well because the story around it is great. So apparently the, the gentleman that sourced this watch first is a mutual friend of ours, Eric Koo, who is a, is a great guy. And so he sold this watch to a guy named Matthew Green, who's also another lovely guy. And I would see this watch on his wrist from time to time, and I said, listen, Matthew, if you ever want to sell this watch, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm trying to pressure you to, but if you ever want to sell this watch, just, you know, give me a call. So we'll cut to a couple of years later, I'm uh, on the treadmill, you know, uh, in, in Singapore, trying to run, and I get this phone call, uh, and I recognize Matthew's number. So, you know, I pick it up, about to say like, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I'm working out, but can you give me a couple of minutes? And the first thing he says is like, hey, wait, I think, uh, you know, I think I might, might sell you that gold AP if you're interested. And I was so shocked, I tripped, slammed face down the treadmill, got shot out the ass of the treadmill, <laughs> Managed to, my phone followed me, it flew up in the air, I managed to catch it, and it was like, sold! <laughs> <laughs> and then a gaggle of modern Omega Speedmasters. Indeed, indeed. I, I somehow just became a massive Speedmaster fan <laughs> in the last six months. I, I've always have been, and, yeah. I, and I had really wanted to purchase, you know, the 2995. But, you know, when I, when I got into it, you know, as opposed to when I got into Rolex, the prices had already just gone up tremendously, right? Mm -hmm. So then I was like, well, maybe I can have some fun with the contemporary watches. So the CK2998, it's just a stunning watch. The size is amazing. The fact that it's using the historic movement, you know, the 1873 is great as well. The style of it as well. And I love the fact that they did it in blue, which they never did before, which as opposed to just doing sort of a replication of the past. And then the coolest thing about this watch for me is it's got a ceramic bezel with a luminous tachymeter in there. Dude, that's awesome, right? <laughs> And then so the other watch that's got a luminous bezel as well as is the Snoopy. This is an amazing demonstration of what watches have meant to the, the history man, right? The astronauts of Apollo 13, they're up, you know, in their spacecraft and all their electronics fail, right? And so they got to figure out a way to angle their spacecraft so it doesn't burn up on re-entry. And how do they do it? With a Speedmaster, right? 14 second burst of the rocket, so at the right angle. I mean, that's just amazing. So I love this watch because it's like on the, uh, the chronograph scale. It says, what can you do in 14 seconds, which is amazing. And then they've got Snoopy, which is the award that NASA gives you of like, you know, you, you do something extraordinary in the service of the space uh, program. And then this last watch, Speedy Tuesday. Of course. So I think there have been two watches that have been extraordinary in terms of how they've shifted the entire game and in, in how watches are communicated and how they're created and how they're sold. So the first one is Speedy Tuesday, which is basically a watch that was launched through social media, right? Yeah. And, and was an homage to the, the Alaska Three. But it just goes to show you the mythology of th these watches today and how they have continued to sort of like resonate so, so well. Then the other watch, which I think is amazing, is the, the, the skipper that you did, oh, right? That's very kind. No, it's amazing. You know, and, and you guys uh, have been so uh, smart about the way you guys have proliferated this limited edition. And to, it's almost to tap into the, the the unconsciousness of the guys that are out there and, and extract from that the watch that they exactly would like to purchase today. And, and I think that that's been amazing. So, so then I have got a watch in my pocket that in some ways is a little bit of an homage to that as well. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna pass that to you and <laughs> you can tell me what you think. And it's a, it's a collaboration between TAG and, and the Rake. So there you go. That is awesome. So we didn't put Skipper in the dial because it's not really a regatta chronograph, but just the whole concept is, is kind of an homage to what you achieved. And it, for us, it was also, we wanted to create the ultimate sort of gentleman's Riviera Capri watch. And so it's going to come with the, the cream NATO strap with the blue That's and the super blue. Cool. You know? Thank what, you very much. When is this much. coming out? In April next year. Dude, very cool. Thank you. So Ben, you know, you know, I guess the one brand that you don't see in this sort of array of timepieces is Rolex. And you sure. know as, as well as I do that I, I, I have a huge affection for Rolex. But the, the, the reason why I didn't bring a Rolex today was that uh, the ultimate Rolex for me is kind of missing. And, and that was a watch that was my grandfather's watch which he then passed to my uncle, and then my uncle passed to me when I was 16. Steel date just, a uh, hobnail gray dial, which I thought was a little bit unusual, on a president bracelet, and, and then uh, my father, a couple years later, he became uh, one of the members of the Enterprise Awards for Rolex. So he said, well, give me your watch, because you know, you've had it for quite some time. And then when he was staying in New York, um, he had it in uh, a hotel room, and it was stolen. Which, you know, that kind of makes me a little bit sad because, you know, there's probably some guy in the world uh, who's got that watch on his wrist and has no under understanding of how meaningful that is to me. So if, if, if what I like to put out there is, is if you're that guy and you stole my watch and you can remember this, so it was a UN Plaza Hotel and it probably was in the early part of uh, the early 90s. I will pay you $10,000 cash, no questions asked, for my watch back. You heard it here first. Exactly. We've got a standing off exactly. and wake up. <laughs> 